Good afternoon. I believe the clock on the wall says that is five o'clock. Military time, that's 1700. <laughs> it's so great to see everyone here this afternoon. And uh, I have a few announcements that I need to cover before we uh, enter into our evening worship. First of all, if we have anyone that's visiting with us, which I looked over the, the orders as I was walking forward and I didn't see anyone, but in case I miss you, we're honored and we're glad that you're here with us this evening. And please give us the opportunity to uh, meet you after our worship service. We're going to ask everyone at this time to please check your any electronic devices you may have and make sure that they're muted. We're going to ask everyone to continue to remember our missionaries and our prayers. And for those who are conducting Bible studies, uh, pray for them as well. After our evening worship this afternoon, it would be Zone 2's turn to sign cards and anyone else who would like to participate uh, in that effort. For the month of May, we were over budget, over budget by $813.79, 813, $813.79. And I did verify the information I put out this morning as far as the uh, committee for the work fair. There is a scheduled meeting next Saturday morning, June 9th at 9 o'clock in the Omni Room. All members of the committee, please attend this meeting. Also, I was informed by one of the elders that breakfast will be served. Our Sharon and Karen group will have a taco salad luncheon next Saturday, June 9th at 12 noon in the Omni Room. Please sign the list on the Sharon and Karen board if you plan to attend. There will be a Young Ladies Day for Moms and Daughters at the Avondale Church of Christ next Saturday, June the 9th from 8.30 in the morning, 8.30 till 5.30 p.m. If enough are interested, a van will be taken there's a sign-up sheet on the desk in the foyer. Please sign up today if you're interested in going. Also, there's an urgent request for assistance for raising funds for Camp Agehi. They are having to make some septic tank upgrades, and they're asking for donations to support that effort. Uh, and if you're interested in help, please uh, make a check out. I believe to the church, and then the church will forward the uh, funds uh, to the proper responsible individuals. This time we also want to remind everyone to continue to pray for the Bettis family of the loss of Eddie Bettis. So continue to pray for that family. Sandra Gail Brown, she was in the hospital, but she's at home right now. Uh, she was released on yesterday. We want to continue to pray for her as well as for Johnny Brown. Continue to keep Johnny in our prayers. And Guy Dickinson had to go to the emergency room for some medical treatment, uh, but was released to go home the same day. So we want to continue to keep Guy as well in our prayers. Leading us in uh, prayer this evening will be Brother Albert White. David Joseph will have the lead us in song and also have the closing prayer. And Brother Steve Weiss will be speaking to us this evening. Those are all the announcements that I have. Again, it's good to see everyone here. Let's go to God in prayer as we enter into our worship service. Most Holy Father, once again, we come before you on this first day of the week. We pray, Father, that as we prepare our minds that you would be with us, that we would totally devote this worship solely on you, Father, your greatness, your love for us, and your son, Jesus, who went to the cross to die on our behalf, that we may have an opportunity, Father, one day to live with you in heaven. We pray, Father, that you would be with us and that we worship you this evening in spirit and in truth. Put you first always, Father, in everything we do. Forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll be using our songbooks again this evening. Our first hymn will be number 148. 
number 148. Let us sing. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Our next hymn will be number 191. Number 191. After this song, we'll be led in prayer. If for the prize we have striven, after our labors are all, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright. Jesus is there. He is the light off in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee, beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea. Yes, a sweet rest is remaining for the true children of God. Where there will be no complaining, never a chastening rod. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam. Free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there. He is the light off in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee, beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea. Soon the bright homeland adorning, we shall behold the glad dawn. Lean on the Lord till the morning, trust till the night is gone. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam. Free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there. He is the light off in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea. Let us pray together. Most gracious, wise, and everlasting Father, as again we approach your throne of mercy, thanking you for all the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your long suffering, your patience, your goodness. We thank you for being our God, caring about us, loving us, and supplying us with those things that we need in this life. Father, we come asking you to bless those that are sick among us, be with them, uh, touch their bodies that they might uh, 
healed, be healed from their illnesses, be with those who care for them, that they might render service, that through your power they might regain their health. Father, we ask you to bless this congregation and all the efforts that we uh, set forth in order to edify and, and glorify and, and lift up your name. We pray that the programs that we have in place for evangelism, that you might bless them, that they might be fruitful, and that your name might be glorified throughout this community. Father, be with the leaders of this congregation. Guide them as they plan, as they uh, view the things of this congregation that we need to do in order to move forward with carrying out your will. Bless our minister as he stands before us boldly and proclaim the gospel. Continue to give him wisdom and knowledge and bless his family that, that they may support him and, and be behind him in the things that he do. Also, bless our eldership here that they may, as elders, uh, guide this flock in a manner that would uh, have you uh, pleased with them. Father, we love you and we care for you and we thank you for your edifying power, your comforting power, and your assuring power that we get through your word. These blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to mark our invitation song. That hymn will be number 706, song after the lesson number 706. And once you have that marked, if you turn to 316, number 316. And if it's convenient for you, let's stand. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning. Leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Please, please. Amen. Oh, how sweet that pathway is. Oh, it is great to be with you again this evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a joy to be with you. I want to ask you to open your Bibles tonight to Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23. Last Sunday evening we spoke about one of the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross and I wanted to continue that here tonight uh, with another saying of Jesus from the cross. As you look at those seven sayings you'll find that three of them are prayers. And this is one of those prayers, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The other being, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the third one would be, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so three of them are prayers, and this being one of them, and 
Uh, most commentators believe that this was the first saying of Jesus from the cross. Friends, as you look at the words there, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, this is one of the greatest statements of mercy found in all of history. This is something that is so profound, so deep, that goes to the very heart of Jesus, who he is. And I want you to get that thought in your mind that Jesus is one who forgives. Amen. Without it, we would have no hope. And this being expressed as one of the seven sayings upon the cross ought to be greatly appreciated, greatly embraced by each one of us because of the circumstances that Jesus was under at that time. Friends, it is also something that's great for us. And so I want to look to begin with at what this phrase meant to those who were there uh, in the presence of Jesus and those who brought about his accusation, his abuse, and his crucifixion upon the cross. What do these words mean to them, or who is he speaking to? Why is it important for them? And then also we're going to look at the application. Why is it important to us today. And so as you think about these things, I want you to think that in your mind that this is a great and profound saying, not only for them of that day, but also for us. Oftentimes, as you consider, one of the most important things that is ever said by a human being might be something that they say when they know that death is imminent. The last words that I'm going to speak to my loved ones, the last words that I'm going to speak to those that I care about, what would they be? If you had an opportunity knowing that your life was going to be coming to an end shortly, who would you want to talk to? And what would you feel would be most important to say to them? Just think about that. What would I want them to hear from my lips? Jesus here knows that he's about to die. He knows that his time on the earth is coming to an end. Of course, he knows about the resurrection. But here on the cross, he wants to speak some words to those people that are out there. And so what words does he choose to speak to them? And so as we th see it here in chapter 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Friends, as we look at this, I want you to understand that, as I said, this is one of the seven last sayings. But as you consider it, what did it mean for them who heard it? And what can it mean for us who hear it today? Number one, it is a prayer. When you think about that word prayer, it literally means to talk to God. That's what it literally means. And so it's not as some uh, that you may have seen on television or some uh, other places that, that people get all excited, they get to jumping up and down, they get to crying, they uh, get so emotional that I want you to look at Jesus' prayer here. It wasn't something that he was overcome with emotion. It wasn't something that he was uttering words. He didn't know what he was saying. That, that wasn't the case at all. But he was addressing it. You remember how he taught the disciples to pray in Matthew 6, verse 9? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so here we see that term, Father. And so here is a son talking to his father, and he's doing it in a coherent way. He's doing it in a way that he is uh, wanting this to be heard and understood by his heavenly father. And so that's the kind of idea that we want. We want to do all things decently in order. When we pray, we want to pray with the understanding, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. And that's what Jesus did. He prayed with the understanding and in a way that others could hear and understand what he was praying. And so that idea should carry over to us as well 
that we have that mindset when we pray. Number one, we're praying to our Father. And number two, we're praying in a manner or in a way that it can be understood. It's not something that's overcome. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have emotions in our prayers. That's not what I'm saying, okay? What I'm saying is not to put on a show like some do. That's not what it's about. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And so prayers being addressed to the Father, that's good and right. Let those things be done in that way as we see Jesus doing here. Then also I want you to know that this was one of the darkest times of Jesus' life. His pain, his shame, all that was going on, the mocking, the spitting, the uh, terrible things that was being spoken about him and spoken to him. We're going to look at that a little bit more later. But this was one of the darkest times of Jesus' life. And he didn't pray for himself here at this point. He could have just broken down and uh, prayed, God, save me from this, and the angels would have come and rescued him. Uh, he could have done that. But he is concerned about those around him. That's what's on his mind. That's what is on his heart. That's who Jesus is. I want you to have that in your mind, that that's who Jesus is when he's praying this. And so at one of the darkest times in all of his life, the first thing that he says from the cross is, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Then I want you to know also that this is a plea. The plea that is being given here, number one, the word said. As you look at Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus said. The word said there is in a tense in the Greek that is called the imperfect tense. And what the word said there is implying is that Jesus said it over and over and over. That it was a repetition that was something that was in his heart and on his mind, and that he was wanting to say this so that God would know that he was sincere. Uh, I've been doing this, and I, I am doing this, is the idea. And so Jesus said, and he said, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, hear me, forgive them. Father, Forgive them. It's what he's saying. That tense of that verb, it implies that repetition in the Greek language. And so he's making a plea uh, for them. And the plea is for forgiveness there at, that he is pleading for. Now this word forgive, uh, keep your finger here. I want you to turn over with me to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, please. And we're going to see something here about this word forgive. The word forgive literally means uh, to loosen, to free, to liberate, to send away. I want you to get that in your mind there, to send away. And so in Psalm 103 and verse number 11, For as the heavens, this is the Hebrew word shamayim, shamayim, which means the upper regions. It's talking about the universe. In the Hebrew language, when the Hebrews would talk about the universe, they would use this word, uh, shamayim, and then they would uh, add to that the word eretz, earth. And so he's saying the upper regions and the lower regions, and so heaven and earth. In Genesis chapter 1, Verse number 1, in the beginning God created the heavens, Shabayim, and the earth, Eretz. And so that's the expanse. The expanse out there. And so you got that picture in your mind about the universe? In Psalm 103, verse 11, For as the heavens are high above the earth, the universe, the stars, the farthest reaches, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. That's Jesus. Forgiveness. Verse 12. 
as far as the east from the, is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. Friends, can you imagine any greater distance? They say that the universe, scientists have guessed, guesstimated to be 46 billion light years across. That's not this galaxy. That's the universe. Uh, you know, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. And so a light year would be the time that the light would travel in a year's time. And then 46 billion light years is considered to be the expanse of the universe. And so as far as the east, the eastern end of the universe is from the western end of the universe... He has put our sins, our transgressions, away from us. Now look at verse 13 there. As a father pities his children, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And so Jesus is putting that image in the minds of the people there that God, when he removes sin, you can't find it anymore. It's gone forever. And so he's saying, Father, my Father, forgive, Father of pities, Father of mercies, forgive them. Put their sin far away. And God is able He's able to forget sin, Hebrews 10, verse 17, so that that sin will be remembered no more. God can choose to do that. Wow. Now, that's what Jesus is saying here in this passage, that they, he's pleading, Father, forgive, Father, forgive, Father, forgive, put their sins away from them. So that's the idea. Now, a third word, you know, we had prayer, then we had plea, now we've got people. Who's the them? Father, forgive them. Who is that? Well, in Acts chapter 2, you remember that Peter there was preaching to the Jews. They were there at the temple, and they were gathered, and he said, you crucified the Son of God. What about the Romans, though? If you look at Luke chapter 23, the Roman soldiers, they took him up Golgotha and there, and they nailed him to the cross. Was it the Romans who killed Jesus? Was it Pilate who condemned him to death? Was it the Jews who brought him before Pilate and falsely accused him? Who was it that killed Jesus? Because isn't that who he's asking forgiveness for? They do not know what they do. You see, that's the ones that he's asking forgiveness for, the ones who didn't know what they were doing. The Romans thought they were putting to death an insurrectionist, someone who was causing problems among the Jews. The Jews thought they were putting to death a false messiah, for if they had known that he was truly the Son of God, they wouldn't have put him to death, Paul said. But then you go to Isaiah 53, and you'll see there that he was wounded for our transgressions. You'll see there that he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Who put Jesus to death? The them that is being spoken of here are those who had accused Jesus falsely, those who had abused him, those who had crucified him, those who were mocking him, those who were there at the cross, those who were involved in all of this. Everyone, that's the them. They don't know what they're doing. That's what Jesus was speaking about. That's what Jesus wanted his Father to forgive, those that were there. But friends, as we think about this, that's not the end of it. Not just those who were there. And we'll see more about that in a moment. The word know. They do not know what they're doing. 
Now, there's a Greek word for no that is called gnosko. Gnosko, uh, that's used in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20, science falsely so called. It's a scientific term by which the process of discovering truth is made. But this is not that word. This word is more of a mathematical term called oida. Oida. And in this mathematical term, he says you can know the truth. Well, let me ask you a question. What's 2 plus 2? Uh, we know the answer, right? It's 4. Why? Because we learned that truth when we were young. We were taught that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And so that would say, well, we know the answer is 4. Well, that would be the Greek word oida. We know that that's the true answer. And so this mathematical term is used here. Jesus is saying, these people don't know how to add 2 plus 2. That they know some of the scriptures, but they don't know that I'm the Son of God. They don't know that I'm the fulfillment of all the prophecies that have been made. And so Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know how to put these things together and do what's right. They don't know. Friends, that's sad. Jesus tried to tell them. He tried to show them. But they still did not know. And so the them included there are those who are doing all these wicked things to Jesus. The them. The word no I mentioned there. What can these words mean for us? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now, we're going to come back to Luke 23. But go to Philippians chapter 2, please. Turn your Bibles, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. Now remember that Jesus was being mocked, he had been scourged, he was hanging on this cross in great pain and agony. They were mocking him, they were accusing him, they were uh, falsely making statements about him and wrongly doing all these things, everything that could be done against him. And friends, you think about it, that's Satan working on him. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Because that's who Jesus is. It wasn't just some moment of something that, hey, I think I, this is what I'll do at this time. No, this was who Jesus was at the very core. Friends, when your life is about to end, when people are mistreating you, your true identity shines through. And so Jesus at the very core, was a man of forgiveness. Now in Philippians chapter 2 in verse number 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What is the application for us today? That we be like-minded with Jesus Christ. Now friends, is there anyone here in this audience this afternoon who has never been offended by a friend or by a brother or sister in Christ? Is there someone here who has never felt their feelings uh, had been stepped on or, or that they had been neglected or mistreated in some way, whether big or small, is there anyone here, if there's someone here that feels that they've never been mistreated by a brother or sister or uh, someone, raise your hand, I'd like to meet you. Every one of us, every one of us has felt mistreated or neglected as a child of God. But there's not a one of us unless... You're a brand new Christian. Now that might be different, but most all of us have experienced hurt feelings. What we've experienced being uh, 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 someone said something, and we heard that somebody said something bad. 
and we felt uneasy. We felt, oh, uh, mm, how, how can I make it right? We felt, well, if somebody feels that way about me, you know how I feel about them. But we've all had that feeling, haven't we? Is there anyone here who has ever been mistreated like Jesus was mistreated on the cross? Not me. I dare say none of you have either. We've never been beaten. We've never been brought before the governor falsely accused. We've never been hung upon the cross and then mocked and spit upon, slapped, never had a crown of thorns put upon our head and a purple robe around our shoulders and Jesus suffered the greatest shame and the greatest pain here at this time. It was bad. But none of us have ever gone through that. And so I want you to look at that. Some may say, well, wait a minute. In Luke chapter 17, you know, uh, he said, now, if your brother repents, forgive him. And so these people didn't repent, so we don't have to forgive, right? Well, if you go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, he talks about that unjust steward. Uh, the, the steward who owed his master some money, and so he went and begged for the master to forgive him the debt. And the master forgave him the debt. And then he turned around to some others, his cohorts, uh, his peers, and he went to them and said, you owe me money. And they begged him for mercy and said, please give us time. We'll pay you all. And he said, no, you got to pay me now. And he threw them in jail. When the master heard this, he called that servant before him and said, because you did not show mercy toward them, I am taking away your mercy. I'm doing that. In Matthew 18, listen to verse 28. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Friends, the whole story here is talking about we need to have a mind that's ready to forgive. If we are holding uh, in our hearts this bitterness, if we're holding in our hearts this idea that, uh, yeah, I forgive you, but guess what? We buried the hatchet, but I left the handle sticking out, right? Right? This vengeance, that's not like Jesus. That's not what it is. And so we need to understand about this and have the same mind that Jesus would have us to have. We need to follow his example that he has indeed had for us in that way. You remember Philippians 4, verse number 6? Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. And so what I want you to think about this is how can we grow to be more like Jesus in this mindset of forgiveness? How can I grow in that way? Well, number one, we need to forgive above what someone deserves. Isn't that what Jesus did? I mean, didn't he forgive above what those people there deserved. They deserved to be put to death. They were putting him to death. You remember the Old Testament law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a life for a life? Some have said. And so they were wrongly putting Jesus to death. And so he could have justifiably condemned them to death. But if he had done that, it would not have been who he is. 
He rose above what they deserved. He rose above the treatment that he received and he brought a higher plane into play. He said, no, I'm not going to be down here where everybody else is. I'm going to be up here where the mercy and the forgiveness of God is going to be applicable for even the worst of people. Because they were the worst. Because they would not believe the miracles. He did a good miracle. He healed a withered hand. They said he doesn't do it except by the power of Beelzebub. Friends, that's a dark heart. Those same hearts were there at the cross. But those are the ones Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And so forgive above what others deserve. Be like Jesus. Developing that forgiveness, as I mentioned. Number one, pray. This is what Jesus did. Father, 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 he was talking to the one above. And so we need to have that same mindset. If we're going to grow to be forgiving like Jesus, when somebody does us wrong, the first thought in our mind shouldn't be that I'm going to get even. It should be I need to pray to my Father about this. That's what we need to have in our mind as we consider being like Jesus Christ. But then also we need to be specific in our prayers. Jesus prayed for those who are mistreating him. That's what he did. Ah, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And so that's the mindset that we need to have. Be anxious for nothing, but by everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. (coughs) Excuse me. That's the mindset that we need. (coughs) As we follow Christ. We'll get it there. All right. Be specific. (laughs) Put yourself in their shoes. Isn't this what Jesus did? Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He was putting himself in their place. Too often, we allow the emotions of the moment to overcome us, to put ourselves in their place. All we can see is the wrong that is being done to us. And we don't think about praying to the Father. We don't think about putting ourselves in their place. And we just want to get even. We want to have our vengeance. But vengeance belongs to God. (coughs) Not to us. Do good to those who treat you bad. Turn over to Luke chapter 6 just a moment. Luke chapter 6. While you're turning there, listen to Matthew 5, which is a parallel passage. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And then in Luke 6.35, but love your enemies, do good. Now we were talking about the verb tenses earlier. Do good is in the imperative tense, which means it's a commandment that we're not to seek our own vengeance. We're not to take uh, 
get back even with them. That's not the idea that we're to do. But we are to do good to them. And lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Isn't that what Jesus did? He was being a son of his Father in heaven. And so he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Now look at verse 36 in Luke 6. Therefore, be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. Jesus, how far should our mercy extend? Even to those who are killing you. That's how far it extends. Thank you, brother. It extends all the way to those who are mistreating you, even those who are putting you to death. Friends, there's no higher way of living. There's no greater manner of thinking than what Jesus exhibited right here hanging on the cross. And we should aspire to be lifted up to that in order that you and I might grow to be like Him, in order that we might be a part of the family of God, in order that we might with all truthfulness be able to say, My Father in heaven. That's what Jesus did. My Father in heaven. Now go back to Luke chapter 23, please. Saved. Here in the next few verses, verse 35 down through verse 39, you'll see that word saved about four different times. And so I want to take note of those here. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. There's the first saved. Let him save himself, the second save, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Can you hear the vileness in their voices? Can you hear the mocking and ridicule? If you be the Son of God, save yourself. Verse 36, The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself, the third save. Verse 38, And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. I want to stop right there a moment. When we talked about them earlier on being those who were there, This insignia, John records, was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Right here, uh, Luke also records this in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Who needed to hear that? Was it just those who were there at the cross? Or is it also us today? And when we say king of the Jews, we're talking about the king of the saved. For not all are Jews who are of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, but those who through faith have put on Christ in baptism, having repented of their sins, confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, put Him in baptism. Verse 39, Luke 23. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Now the question comes to mind, why did Jesus not take them up on this challenge? Why did he not come down from the cross? Why did he not save himself and others there with him? He could have. He had the power. He could have called for the twelve legions of angels and they would have rescued him. He could have, by his own will, come down off of that cross and not suffered anymore. They called him to do it. Why did he not do it? Why did he not come down? 
<clears throat> he did it so that you and I could be saved. They told him, save yourself. But he refused. Jesus prayed and he pleaded for their forgiveness. He didn't pray for his own forgiveness. He had not sinned. He prayed for their forgiveness and the only way that they could be forgiven was if His blood, His life's blood was poured out there in that sacrifice. It's the only way. There was no other way. He could have saved Himself but then mankind would have been lost. and There would have been no hope for you and me. And so he prayed and he pleaded for those who were there. But friends, that's not the end of it. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. You and me. Who's the advocate? It's the one who prayed, who pled with his Father, forgive them, the people, for they do not know what they're doing. That's the one who's my advocate. Friends, that's the greatest advocate I could ever have in all of eternity, is Jesus Christ. Who he is, is one who pleads for the forgiveness of mankind. And he's there at the right hand of the Father pleading for my forgiveness as well. Jesus Christ the righteous, he is called by John. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but John says for the whole world. Friends, those people there who were mocking, who were so dark in their hearts, who were so corrupted and defiled that they couldn't see the truth if it had come up and slapped them in the face. Jesus prayed for them to be saved, to be forgiven, and that their sins be taken so far away that the universe wouldn't recognize it anymore. Now he's my advocate and yours because of who he is, Jesus the righteous, advocating on your behalf before the Father in heaven. What about it? Do you love this passage? Father, forgive them. Friends, I remember Brother Basil Overton used to say, I love what I'm doing because I don't know what I'm doing. David prayed that he be forgiven of those sins he didn't know he committed. Friends, sometimes we need to pray that as well. But we have that advocate, Jesus the righteous. What about you tonight? Do you need Jesus to advocate on your behalf tonight? He's ready, He's willing, but you need to ask Him. You need to come believing and repenting, confessing His name, being ready to be lowered in that watery grave of baptism, or maybe you need to repent of sin having already been baptized. Jesus is still ready. He's still who He is, and He's ready to advocate for you. So if there can be any way that we can help you here tonight, Please come to the front while we stand together and sing this song. Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctified throne. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? What do you hope, dear brother, 
to gain by a further delay. There's no one to save you but Jesus. There's no other way but his way. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to bless you. There's danger and death in delay. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? If you have not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, it is prepared. Uh, we'll sing the first verse of hymn number 337, and if you make your way to one of the front two pews, you'll be served. Number 337. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Please be seated. Let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we're thankful for you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. We pray that you will bless those who are about to protect this bread, that they might do it in a manner that's acceptable in your sight. These blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Heavenly Father, be with the ones this evening that are partaking of this fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood as he died on the cross. Pray that you be with each one of them as they partake of it. Forgive us from our sins. These things we pray through your son's name. Amen. give thanks for the offering. Father, we're so thankful to you for the blessings that you bestow upon us, that you allow us to be able to go out and provide for our families and ourselves. And we pray, Father, as those who are about to give, that they may give uh, with a sincere heart and the money may be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom and the glorifying of, of your name. These blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. closing hymn tonight will be number 119, just the first verse of number 119. 
Uh, before that, we'll have a prayer, and then that song will dismiss us. Uh, let's stand for the prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful at your grace, your kindness, your mercy, and your long-suffering towards us, Heavenly Father, and we are equally thankful for you sending your Son to show us the ultimate example. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll take full advantage of all of the enormous sacrifice that has been made so that we can be in heaven with you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll take this information and share it with those that we come in contact with. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to leave, we pray that you give us a safe journey to our destinations. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for all that you continue to do for us. In Jesus' name we do pray and also give thanks. Amen. Number 119. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us never molested though in the wrong farther along we'll know all about it farther along we'll understand why cheer up my brother live in the sunshine we'll understand it 